Good morning. Here we go again. And today, with the discussion on the oculomotor system, which is a very interesting one, has a lot of math into it. And particularly, it's uh, important because it gives a clear idea, a clearer idea of the working of the nervous system in networks. So let's take a look at roughly the objectives of this first lecture. So we have to go into the role of eye movements in visual perception. Then we have to discuss the peripheral and the central mechanisms involved in that movement and the properties of various subsystems subserving their function. Now, the first thing to have clear in mind is that, that you have a peripheral apparatus. This is a motor system, right? So you have a peripheral apparatus that takes care of the action, which are the eye muscles. And um, it's not uh, very, very interesting from a clinical point of view because, it's, uh, as we are going to see later on, it's not very common to have an individual eye muscle that is at deficit. Uh, it occurs, but it's not so frequent. Uh, but the, at this point, have a clear idea that there are six pairs of extraocular muscles. And uh, the action of each of these muscles it depends on various factors. One is the actual shape of the orbit, which is not the perfect conus. Uh, the other is the insertion points of the muscles because that will determine where the eye, you know, on the one hand they insert in the eye globe, on the other hand they insert somewhere else. Uh, and uh, it depends on the insertion points, then the action of that individual muscle. But even more important, and that becomes a problem, is that it has to do also with the initial position of the eye. So, because if you are looking straight forward and, and you conceive in the contraction of one muscle, it will give you a particular movement of that eye. But if you, on the other hand, are looking to the right all the way and you contract that individual muscle, the action of that, it will be different. So for the standpoint of, uh, of uh, having some idea of individual muscle uh, action, uh, let's consider what each of the muscles do when you look straight forward to start with. The initial position is uh, looking straight forward. So you have the lateral rectus gives you a biduction, means that the eye goes all the way out. The medial rectus, just the reverse, takes all the eye all the way inward. You know, this is the nose, of course. Then you have a superior rectus that elevates the eye globe, but at the same time pushes it a little bit inward. So the guy goes an elevation and a deduction. Then you have an inferior rectus that does just the reverse. It depresses the eye globe, but also pulls it inward. Now you have the oblique muscles. The inferior oblique will extort the eye globe and elevate it at the same time. What do I mean by extort? When in the torsion movement, if this is the eye globe, this is a torsion movement, see? And it's indicated by the direction of the 12 o'clock position, all right? So in my right eye, if this is a 12 o'clock position and the eye globe does like that, it means extortion. If it does the other way, it's intorsion. So the inferior oblique is an extorter, an, ele an elevator. And the finally, the superior oblique is an intorter and depressor, depressor. So you have to have that more or less in mind. Uh, as you know, uh, the lateral rectus is innervated by the sixth nerve. All the, the recti muscles are innervated. And the inferior oblique also are innervated by the third nerve. And finally, the superior oblique is innervated by the fourth nerve. Now, function, what are the functional properties? Well, if you are used to look at, at 
people's eyes, you see that both eyes move at the same time. So the eye movements are binocular. Very seldom you have an individual that can move one eye at a time. All right? The rule is you move both eyes at the same time. Now, the important thing is that all six pairs, now we are talking about essentially 12 eye muscles, considering both sides at the same time, all the six pairs are either actively excited or actively inhibited in a particular movement. So the nervous system has to do a lot to do to come up with that uh, uh, result. Now, you can classify the eye movements according to their direction. So if you have, for instance, if these are the lines of sight of, my, of uh, the eyes, and these are the eye globes, all right, you see that during a movement, the lines of sight can stay parallel. So you can see, to the movement to the right, movement to the left, movement up, movement down, in the oblique planes, all right? This is a binocular movement that is called the conjugate movement, when the light, lines of sight become, uh, are parallel. Now, when they move, as in the examples that I just gave you, these are called versive movements. And when they don't move, when the lights of sight remain constant and the eye globes move, that you have the clockwise and counterclockwise eye movements, which are, again, binocular. So this is expressed here. So we went to the conjugate versive, horizontal, vertical, and oblique, the torsion movements, clockwise and counterclockwise. Now, there is another kind of eye movements that are not conjugate, means that the lines of sight do not remain parallel during the movement. Either they cross in front of the body or they cross in the back of the body. That's what is called vergence movements, can be convergent or divergence. Central mechanisms, all right? And central mechanisms, you have to differentiate several subsystems within the oculomotor system that fulfill different functions and utilize different mechanisms. We start with the so-called saccadic subsystem. Uh, this subsystem takes care of the of saccades that we'll define in a moment, and also of the fast phases of nystagmus. Now, what is the stimulus to elicit a saccadic eye movement? Remember that eye movements are binocular all the time. Uh, what's the stimulus? Is actually the different location of a steady target in the visual field. For instance, if I looking at you and then I want to shift my gaze to her, I'm shifting my gaze through a saccadic movement, through a saccade. And this, this, um, this uh, saccade has special properties. First of all, it's done at very high velocities of the order of hundreds of degrees per second. This is angular velocities, of course. Another property is that it can be performed voluntarily. And that's what exactly what I did. If I, I am looking at this and, and then I want to shift my gaze to another target, I, I'm deciding to do that and I do it through a saccade. Finally, very interestingly, uh, vision is suppressed during saccades. You see, during the, the actual movement of the eyes, you are essentially blind. And it makes some sense because on moving the eyes, even at high velocity as the saccade occurs, you see that the entire environment is being displaced on the retina. And we start discuss this in more detail in the visual system. It's, di it's displaced the retina to the opposite side. However, when I do the saccade, the world s remains still. And it remains still because I don't see that displacement. Uh, there is a, a, a very simple experiment that you can do. For instance, if you look at yourself in a mirror and you see your eyes, all right, and you have a friend in the back of you looking at the mirror, and you move the eyes to the left, let's say, you don't see the eye movement in the mirror, but your friend does. Your friend sees that your, move, that your eyes have actually moved to the left and you don't see it. Because while you execute the saccade, the saccade 
vision is suppressed. This is an interesting thing. Now, this is the saccadic eye movement uh, subsystem. Now we go to another one. Yes, which is the smooth pursuit subsystem. This is a completely different kind of movement because the stimulus now is actually, uh, as I said there, I'm sorry, that you know, this takes care of the ocular pursuit, the following something with the eyes, and also the slow phases of nystagmus, whatever they are elicited by. Now, the stimulus for a smooth pursuit subsystem is the displacement of the target on the retina, what is called the retinal slip. And of course, if you keep your eyes still, if you keep your eyes still and you move your head, all right, the images on the on the retina will shift, all right, and but your eyes are following it. So the, the that displacement of the image of your target on the retina elicits that smooth smooth pursuit eye movement. You can do it in some other way. You keep your head fixed, but now you ask the patient to follow your finger. And by for you know, when I move my finger, the image of the finger is displaced on the retina, and that elicits the pursuit movement. Now, what are the properties of these movements? First of all, that the velocity more or less matches the velocity of the retinal slip, of, the, of, the, of your stimulus, actually. And it can follow up to maybe 50, 50, 60 degrees per second, something of that sort. Then it fuses and you doesn't work anymore. Now, another property is that these are completely involuntary. You cannot perform a pursuit, or a smooth pursuit eye movement by will. On the other hand, you can say, oh, yes, I'm going to move my eyes very slowly, you know, from one to another. And what you are actually doing is small saccades that can be perfectly well recorded. All right? So you cannot make a smooth pursuit voluntarily without retinal sleep. Finally, another important feature is that here is where the cerebellum and the vestibular mechanisms that we discussed in previous lectures are very much involved. And that's why problems with, you know, patients with cerebellar problems have problems in visual pursuit. So you, you have already two, two, two subsystems, saccadic and ocular pursuit. Let's see another one. Um, optokinetic nystagmus or optokinetic movements in general. These are movements that are elicited by moving targets across the field. If they are uh, in move in succession across the field, you get a nystagmus so that the eyes will slowly follow the direction of these stripes and then will jump to the opposite side. And if the stripes keep on moving, as for instance when you put the patient or the subject inside a rotating drum, again, it will elicit a slow movement in the direction of rotation and a fast comeback. Now, the stimulus, as I, I'm putting there, is successive moving targets across the visual field. Now, the properties. The alternating slow phase is similar to pursuit in the direction of the moving target, and the fast phase is similar to the saccade uh, in the opposite direction. Now, the direction, remember that the direction of nystagmus is always named by the direction of the fast phase that we discussed in the vestibular system already. So that's uh, optokinetic movements, and nystagmus is a very clear example of that. Now, you have another central mechanism that is the vestibular ocular reflex. You, um, we already discussed it in the vestibular system, right? Uh, you know that the stimulus will be a head movement that displaces the planes of the semicircular canals and the endolymph will either push or pull the cupula and result in excitation or inhibition of the corresponding um, receptors. Um, 
what are the properties of the vestibular ocular reflex? Uh, that, that we didn't discuss in the vestibular system because it's good at this point to compare it with the autognetic responses, which are visually elicited. <coughs> You know, the VOR is elicited by vestibular stimulation. The optokinetic responses are elicited by visual stimuli. Now, it so happened, and they supplement each other. It so happened that the vestibular response can attain a much higher frequency than the ones that are visually elicited. And you can uh, prove that very easily yourself if you take a, a, a written piece of paper. Uh, read, uh, and you read what it says, and then you move it at a certain rhythm, all right? You move it without moving your head, all right? It blurs. You, you cannot see it. You cannot read it. On the other hand, if you keep it fixed and you move your head at the same rhythm, you read it perfectly well because the frequency of response of the system is considerably higher in the vestibular than in the visual. Is that clear? Any questions? Uh, an interesting property of the VOR also is that it's suppressed by cerebellar mechanisms during ocular and head orientation towards the target. What does it mean? Well, if I if I want to, you know, some people, you know, paranoiacs or whatever, they can keep the head still and then they want to look to the right and they just move the eyes to the right. But that, you don't do that. You know, if I want to see something on the right, I orient my head and eyes to the right. The head goes together with the eyes. But look what happened. The eyes are going to the right, but if my head is going to the right, the VOR is shifting the eyes to the left. And you don't want that. You want to keep on looking to the right. And therefore, it is the job, one of the jobs of the cerebellum to suppress the VOR when you want to fix a target visually. I hope that is clear. All right. Now, one more central mechanism, virgin subsystem. Remember that the eye movements could be conjugate or could, come, could be virgent. It means convergence or divergence, all right? The most common one that is readily seen is the convergence that occurs when the target of regard approaches you and is at the near distance. So at that moment, the images of that object fall on heterotopic points in the retina. And the, that's the stimulus for the eyes to converge to, so to keep the two images fused. So that kind of, uh, of movement, which is the That kind of movement is of low velocity, right? The mechanism is not so clearly understood, although quite a amount of progress has been made recently on that. And the important thing for you to remember is that it works together with pupillary constriction and accommodation. That we will discuss in the visual system, what pupillary constriction means and what accommodation means. But anyway, these are mechanisms of the organism to have clearer near vision. And so when the object comes close to, to yourself and you want to look at it, what you do, you converge your eyes, your pupils constrict at the same time, and your lenses, your intraocular lenses, accommodate to this new distance to get the image of the uh, object uh, sharp. All right. Now that ends this first part of the subject, and let's review this. Eye movements are binocular and require participation of the 12 six pairs of eye muscles. Then the eye movement may be conjugate, as we discussed, versive or torsion movements, or, or they can be versions, which is convergence or divergence. Saccades are executed to bring the object of regard to the center of the retina. They are fast, can be voluntary, and vision is suppressed during their occurrence. Smooth pursued eye movements are elicited by 
slippage of the retinal image, they match more or less the velocity of the slippage, are involuntary and under vestibular and cerebral control. Optokinetic reflexes, one of them is optokinetic nystagmus, contributes to stabilize the visual world during movements of visual images. The vestibular ocular reflex stabilizes also the visual world by deviation of the eyes in the direction opposite to the rotation of the head. The version system allows to fuse the actual images falling on heterotopic points as when looking at the near object it works together with pupillary constriction and accommodation. All right, um, what's the time? Um, I think we can proceed with this other portion of the oculomotor system in which we are going to discuss both the structure, the function that will supplement what we already just said and go into the dysfunction, which for you is more, most important. All right. Objectives of this second part of the lecture. It will be, first of all, the concept of networks that I mentioned that initially in the oculomotor system. Then to discuss the functional pathways for saccades in the horizontal plane, functional pathways for saccades in the vertical plane, and eventually the effects of lesions on the direction of gaze. And here I have to mention uh, Maurice P. Bender, who was our mentor initially at Mount Sinai and with whom we collaborated for I don't know, 25 years or so. And that uh, was one of the really promoters of the research in the eye movement field. And uh, many of the things that I'm going to tell you about now uh, are part of his general way of thinking. Now, the concept of networks. You see, the nervous system has to do with a, a, an enormous computational job, the central nervous system, right? Because it has to, for the precise gaze to one spot in the environment, it has to either activate or inhibit each one of the 12 eye muscles in a very precise amount, right? That's what I'm trying to say here, right? See the complex, and for that job, it needs several networks that perform in the computation. So they have to precisely excite or inhibit in each of the 12 extraocular muscles, each one in a precise amount, to end up with a precise direction of gaze to the target of regard. Now, here you have to become used to designations that are not referable to discrete anatomic systems or pathways or tracts. These are actually location of networks. One will be the MRF, which is the midbrain reticular formation, and the other is the PPRF, which is the paramedian pontine reticular formation. Have these two terms in mind and always think in terms that these are location of networks and not precise tracts, as you are used to in the motor system in general. All right. Let's, uh, let's discuss functional pathways for saccades in the horizontal plane. I'm emphasizing the, the, the concept of functional pathways because they are not discrete anatomic pathways. Right? Again. So we get you, you know, we, we get information through experiments and through observations in patients. Right? For instance, you can do electric stimulation in the monkey and occasionally in the human during neurosurgery. And some of these electric stimulations are eliciting deviations of gaze. And it goes more or less like that, that the gaze shifts contralateral to the side of stimulation in a horizontal or oblique plane from regions, from regions in the cerebral cortex, widespread areas, frontal, rightal, 
occipital. Right. And then when you put your electrode deep in the brain, deep brain stimulation, uh, from the subcortex, you get the same thing. You get contralateral gaze deviation. And all this outflow of the cortex more or less gets like funneled or concentrated towards the subthalamic region. Right. And then after the subthalamus, what comes after the subthalamus? After the thalamus? What the next part of the brain, of the nervous system? So of course the brain stem, right? And first would be the midbrain. So again, in the brainstem tegmentum, in the region of the MRF, the midbrain reticular formation, also produces deviations to the opposite side when you stimulate in that region. And that happens down to the level of the caudal midbrain. But once you keep on sinking your electrodes and you are beyond the level of the caudal midbrain, now the movements in the horizontal or oblique planes become ipsilateral. Right? And it goes like that from the caudal midbrain through the PPRF to the level of the six nerve nucleus. Now there is one more thing that you can do with stimulation. There is one spot that if you stimulate, it will produce an adduction of the ipsilateral eye only. And this comes from a, bundle, a discrete bundle of fibers, the only discrete bundle of fibers in the system that is called the MLF of medial longitudinal fasciculus. All right, from this you have to absorb the fact, essentially, that electric stimulation will give you from the brain down to the MRF to the level of the caudal midbrain will give you contralateral gaze deviation. And beyond that, to the level, through the PPRF to the level of the sixth nerve nucleus, will give you ipsilateral gaze deviation. Already, you can start formulating in your mind what is happening here. This information is supplemented by the re results of both experimental lesions in monkey as well as pathology in the human. It's just exactly the same. Pathologies and lesions that cause paresis of gaze. Instead of eliciting the gaze, the gaze is paretic or, 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 or non-existent altogether. So what happened there? Again, you have contralateral gaze paresis in horizontal or oblique planes from the cerebral hemispheres requiring extensive damage and also from the brainstem through the MRF down to the level of the caudal midbrain. It is really like a mirror image of the stimulation. The lesion will produce exactly the reverse. On the other hand, when the lesion and the pathology is, is uh, in the brainstem from the caudal midbrain through the PPRF to the level of six nerve nucleus, the paralysis of gaze will be ipsilateral. Finally, if the lesion is in the MLF, purely, remember that stimulation of the MLF was giving purely an A deduction of the ipsilateral eye. In this case, there will be failure of A deduction of the ipsilateral eye on attempted contralateral gaze. Now, these are, are some. Um, I think that we can skip that. This is actually uh, serial resections of one hemisphere. You can see it will be in the normal, and we are recording optokinetic nystagmus, and the blips down means movement to the left, saccades to the left. All right. So from the right hemisphere, you get a good nystagmus to the to the left. All right. Now, if you resect the occipital lobe and even the preoccipital region, that were regions that are essential for eliciting eye movements, you see that there is not much problem. And if at that time you eliminate now the frontal region that is supposed to contain also a frontal eye field, there is not much problem. If in addition you take the entire temporal lobe, that temporal lobe here, no much problem either. And now you resect the premotor area and the motor area. 
And now you have the animal is hemiplegic on the left side, and the optokinetic nystagmus remains. So in a, at that moment, if you remove also the parietal portion, and now there is a, a really smidget of hemisphere remaining, right? Then you have a transient deficit, but very soon it recovers. That means, you know, I give you this as an example that the dysfunction is unpredistributed over the cerebral cortex. Although there are spots of very low, lay, of very low uh, um, threshold that the elicit eye movements and other regions need more stimulation to elicit the eye movements, the overall concept is that one hemisphere is really important for driving the eyes to the opposite side. The entire as a, as a distributed function. Uh, here you have another example of the same thing after a one stage left hemidecortication in horizontal OKN. What, what would you, you would expect? You would expect that the nystagmus with a quick face to the right will be a deficit, all right? And you can see here at, at the preoperative level you have both to the right and to the left are all right. But then, as soon as the, uh, the cortex is removed in one shot, you have a deficit, a profound deficit, in the nystagmus to the opposite side, which is to the left, with the nystagmus to the uh, nystagmus to the. I'm making fun of no? something is wrong here. After after the removal of the left hemisphere, then the nystagmus to the right is a deficit. The nystagmus to the left remains always or always the same because it's somehow influenced by the right hemisphere, which is intact. But you can see here again that over time the function recovers. That means that the, at the cerebral level, things have to be really massive to produce a deficit in the contralateral eye movements. Now here you have an example of the MLF, uh, one of the sections that I showed you before in the brainstem, but shows very clearly very clearly this tract, all right? Very clear, the only, the only well-defined anatomic tract in the system, that's the MLF, all right? And goes from the level of the third nerve nucleus here to the level of the sixth nerve nucleus here. And when you damage one MLF, what's going to happen? The patient will have a failure of a deduction of the ipsilateral eye on attempted contralateral gaze. We'll see it in a moment. You have here an example in, in an animal, all right? Uh, take a look. In, this animal is trying to look to the left, and you can see that the left eye moves out, but the, left, the right eye remains in the middle line. And if the animal tries to look to the right, now the right eye goes all the way, and the left eye remains in the middle line. This animal has a bilateral MLF lesion, and bilateral MLF problems in the human are not uncommon because it is a very heavily myelinated tract that is, can be affected for many things and one of them would be in MS, in demyelinating disease. All right, so now let's, uh, let's review the whole system uh, from, from top to bottom, let's say, uh, and use as an example a deviation of gaze to the left, right? What what, what's the mechanism on what's the structures and networks in, implicated in moving your gaze from in front of you to your left side? You have a midline here. This is the right eye and this is the left eye. So you are executing a conjugate gaze to the left. That's what you're executing. All right, how, how do you do that? Well, first of all, you have the six, six nerve nucleus here that has motor neurons that are going to innervate the lateral rectus of the left eye. You also have, on the other side, you have the oculomotor nerve nucleus, all right, that are going to innervate the medial rectus of the right eye. And when both of these happen is when you have the conjugate gaze to the left. But how do you put these two things together so they will act together? This, this is a completely peripheral mechanism. So, let's start with the cortex, all right? We said that ample regions of the cortex, frontal, parietal, occipital, all right, give rise to impulses that descend towards the 
midbrain, right? In a more or less convergent fashion. And in the in the midbrain is where these um, important uh, networks start working at the midbrain reticular formation or MRF. The result of that computation now from the experiment that I showed you before and the results of pathology is that the system crosses the midline. It's a functional decusation. You don't, you don't see a tract crossing. Right? And that occurs in the caudal midbrain. And then the, the functional pathway descends through the PPRF to the level of the six nerve nucleus. Well, that's, that's fine, right? Because now you have that you decide to move the eyes to the left, and you have here the mechanism at least to move the left eye to the left. It's right there already, the circuit. But now how at the same time you move your right eye to the left? Well, that's because the six nerve nucleus, there are special neurons, not just the motor neurons that innervate this muscle, but special neurons that are called internuclear neurons, right? The axons of which crosses the midline and ascends in the MLF to reach the third nerve nucleus. Right? So here you have the entire mechanism, right? Because through this initial system, the left eye moves out. And through this further system, the right eye moves also uh, to the left. All right. So now there are, there are other controlling uh, mechanisms on the oculomotor system. You may remember when you studied the motor system in general that there were motor control systems. One was the basal ganglia system, the other was the cerebellar system, and you are more or less familiar with that, or supposed to be familiar with that. Well, it so happened here that the oculomotor system, as I just described it for saccades, all right, all these, all these mechanisms are under some control are under some control from the basal ganglia. For instance, uh, you have here a structure, the superior colliculus, that is in the midbrain, that was supposed to be very important for eye movements. Well, I can tell you that you then destroy the superior colliculus and you don't see much except some micro neurologic signs that require special methods to measure the latency of, uh, of uh, gaze directed. Uh, or visually directed gaze, uh, you know, there are problems, sure, but at the bedside, you don't see them. So in any case, know that there is a, a projection from the frontal lobe to the colliculus, and the colliculus in turn influences the, this ipsilateral MRF. Also, you know that the frontal lobe uh, has uh, a good frontocodate or front corticostriate pathway that influences the codate nucleus and the codate nucleus projects also to the substantia nigra reticulata that is similar to the external pallidum in the system and the substantia nigra reticulata has an output to the colliculus and again, the colliculus influences the MRF. So there is various various ways in which the colliculus will influence the oculomotor system at the MRF level, and that includes these basal ganglia uh, components. And you have indeed problems with eye movements in Parkinson's disease. Let's say. All right. Now let's see uh, the main effects of lesions. Let's say you have the system as just just outlined it. Right, and you have now uh, you have now a paresis of, or weakness of gaze to the left. All right. So if you ask the patient, you know, look to the left or follow my finger to the left, whatever, or look at my finger that is on the left side, the eyes stay in the midline. The patient has a problem in shifting the gaze to the left. What can it be the problem? It may be a problem in the, cere in the cerebral hemisphere. The lesion has to be large, right? We discussed this before. Small lesions don't do much. The lesion should be extensive to, to present with a paresis of gaze to the opposite side. Usually, you know, in a stroke, for instance, um, initially 
the, the gaze may be deviated to the side of the hemiplegia, which means that there is a gaze preference to the uh, to the a gaze preference that is maybe induced by the intact hemisphere, uh, but very very soon it recovers. So the lesion, you know, to have a persistent gaze paresis from a cerebral lesion, the lesion should be extensive. All right. Now you can have lesions here. You can have lesions in the MRF, in the midbrain tegmentum, right? But you go now to lower levels of the system, for instance, in the PPRF, the lesion can be tiny, can be very small, close to the midline, and interrupting these, these uh, networks and producing a, now an ipsilateral paralysis of gaze. All right, what happened when you now? Uh, have a lesion in the MLF, in the medial longitudinal fasciculus, in this internuclear connection here. Right? When you have that, a lesion in the MLF, you will have the following. There will be a failure of a, a failure of a deduction of the ipsilateral eye on attempting contralateral mm -hmm. gaze, so that you tell the patient, look to the left, look to the left. You're pushing the patient to treat to look to the left, and you will see that the left eye goes out, but the right eye remains in the midline. All right? That's characteristic of the MLF. In addition, there will be nystagmus in the AB ducted eye. But the important thing is that this problem is not due to a problem in the medial rectus here. In, in the medial rectus here, all right? Because if you ask the patient to converge, to look at the tip of his nose, the patient will converge perfectly well, converge perfectly well. That means that this medial rectus is functioning and that this just the supra, the, you know, networks above the level of the nuclei that produce this MLF syndrome. So in that way, we are more or less agreed on the functional pathways for saccades in the horizontal and they can be also oblique planes right because you have you, you can have a a, a, a paris of gaze uh, to look uh, to the right and up more than directly to the right but anyway within within the eye movements themselves is that this kind of a vector system that you know an oblique movement has a, 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 a horizontal component that follows the rules that we just discussed, right? So anything that is parallel of gaze to the left, being in the horizontal plane or in any of the oblique planes, that mechanism that we discussed so far applies. But what happens now when you have problems in the strict vertical plane? All right, that, that has been always a problem. Maybe it's still a debatable problem. But I'll give you first some facts on this, all right? For instance, if you unilateral stimulation or lesion, remember that we were using these unilateral stimulations or lesions uh, or the pathology or, or in your neurosurgery and seeing all the time that unilateral stimulation was producing a contralateral eye, deviation, eye deviations in the horizontal or oblique planes. It never affects strictly vertical eye movements. You cannot obtain a vertical eye movement from a unilateral stimulation or a unilateral lesion, as we saw before. So keep that in mind. Now, on the other hand, bilateral simultaneous stimulation of the cortex may elicit upward or downward eye movements. I'll show you in a moment that. That has to be bilateral, all right? Another thing, bilateral lesions of the PPRF Remember the unilateral lesion PPRF gives you paresis of gaze to the same side, ipsilateral. But how about bilateral lesions in the PPRF? They will produce a total ophthalmoplegia, means that the patient will, will not be able to look to the right or to the left, but the patient will not be able to look up or down either. Finally, another fact, 
is remember that we were doing caloric stimulation in the vestibular system and if you irrigate it with the head erect and the right eye and cold water what's going to happen well the eyes are going to go to the side irrigated and beat back nystagmus to the opposite side in the horizontal plane so what happens now if you do if you irrigate both ears at the same time you can do that that will result in vertical nystagmus it's vestibular origin but it's vertical in direction so there are various facts that that are basis of some kind of a theory of speculation and this was essentially benders all right that the vertical eye movements may result from simultaneous activation of the pathways to the right and to the left in some way activated at the same time all right here you have some results of cortical stimulation for instance you can see that unilateral stimulation in this panel here you see that the little segments here indicate the direction of the eye movements so they are always contralateral all right and they can be oblique for instance contralateral and down and now if you do simultaneous bilateral stimulation of these points particularly the points that were giving oblique movements you get now a direct vertical deviation either upward or downward now here you have an example this is in a monkey uh, of a bilateral PPRF lesion you know these are very this is the middle line and there are very tiny lesions on each side maybe a millimeter or so that is why quite magnified and this results in total ophthalmoplegia the eyes cannot be moved right left up or down all right so what you have patients that have problems in isolated gaze upward they can move the eyes horizontally but they cannot move the eyes upward so what are these critical structures where are the lesions that will give you this kind of syndrome well, it, it so happened that the lesion has, is most of the time is in the pretectum, in the region of the brain that is in front of the superior colliculi, all right? and the lesion is either bilateral or is in the midline, destroying the posterior commissure, and that produces what is called the pretectal syndrome, that consists of paralysis of upper gaze, pupillary alterations also, the pupil doesn't constrict well to light and finally produce also eyelids retraction retraction of the eyelids i'll show you photographs of that here for instance in this protected syndrome this is called a patient it was an original patient in the early 20th century and you can see that keeps the eyes down and there is some retraction of the eyelids here i think here's in the monkey uh, we don't know the pathology of this man all right but in the monkey you have the same thing you see you see the retraction of the upper lid and also of the lower lid, by the way, and some pupillary disturbances, all right? And where is the lesion? We know where the lesion of the monkey is. I can show you that. You see this cut in the middle line? Here, here is interrupting the posterior commissure, which is a good myelinated dark bundle from side to side. And this is a, practically a slit lesion in the posterior commissure. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, when a patient presents with a paralysis of upper gaze, you can bet anything that the lesion involves both sides or the midline in the pretectal area. How about down? We said that for upward gaze, right? Well, you know, when the lesion is large, extensive, it may it may um, result in both problems in upward and downward gaze, but that doesn't solve much of the problem, right? The problem is one what happens just for downward gaze and that has been a very difficult problem to follow um, uh, there was um, you know we tried for many years uh, various stimulation and lesion experiences in monkeys but eventually there was a case here at mount sinai all right that was That gives you already the result, but I want to show you the case. Look, this patient, you ask the patient, look up, and the eyes go all the way up. 
And then you say, you tell the patient, look down. And the eyes stayed in the horizontal plane, all right? Cannot look down. Now, this patient came to post-mortem uh, and showed a huge lesion in a butterfly shape that is called, that the, it involves many structures here. These are the red nuclei of the midbrain. So this is rostral to the rostral and and, uh, and dorsal to the red nuclei, but involves also thalamus and so forth and so on. However, using this as a guide, we did some work in the monkey, and uh, it was very very clear. We did bilateral simultaneous stimulation. We put electrodes in this general area, right on both sides, and you see here that uh, at certain, uh, this is without stimulation. The animal is under anesthesia, by the way. Uh, under no stimulation, the eyes look, you know, straight, straight ahead. With some stimulation, the both eyes go down, and with more intense stimulation, they go all the way down the eyes. All right, and of course, we made some lesions in that same spot that were giving these results on stimulation, and these lesions involved this essentially. The area you see this is the thalamus, this is the subthalamic region, this is the substantia nigra, and here you have this the region that is rostral to the uh, to the red nucleus, right? And in a sagittal section that you can recognize here, this corpus callosum, and here the superior colliculi, and here the red nucleus, all right? And in front of the red nucleus, this is a composite of several animals. This is the minimal lesion that will produce the downward gate palsy. And therefore, uh, we feel that critical structures for downward gaze are contained in this rostral portion to the uh, red nucleus. All right, so we can uh, summarize all this information in the following way. The oculomotor system consists of a series of networks computing the precise amount of excitation of inhibition of each of the 12 eye muscles to drive both eyes to a precise target of regard. The right and left systems decussate in the caudal midbrain. That's important. So lesions usually large above the decussation, cerebrum, midbrain, result in paralysis of gaze to the contralateral side. Whereas lesions, usually small, below the decusation, in the pons essentially, result in paralysis of, or paralysis of gaze to the ipsilateral side. Lesions of 1 MLF results in failure of a deduction of the ipsilateral eye on attempted contralateral gaze. That's essential for you to, to understand it and to clearly express it, because it's not just a failure of a deduction of the ipsilateral eye, it's only the failure when the patient attempts to look to the contralateral side. A few more messages. The systems of both sides participate in driving the eyes in the strict vertical plane. The lesions must be bilateral or in the midline to alter vertical gaze. Bilateral lesions of the pretectum or in posterior commissure result in paralysis of upward gaze, defective pupillary constriction to light, and retraction of the eyelids. And bilateral lesions in the midbrain thalamus junction prerubral fields result in alterations purely in downward gaze. And with that, we close the subject, and I hope that you will digest it properly and learn it and any questions of course I'm here. Thank you.